Um, welcome to our session. We're going to be talking about um, the uh, Al Jazeera Media Network's uh, Drupal 8 platform. So glad to have you here. Uh, my name is Mai Irie. I'm a software architect at Phase 2. Um, and I worked as one of the leading developers on this platform. Hi all, my name is Tian. Uh, I am a head of product at Al Jazeera Media Network. Uh, I mostly manage a lot of the uh, digital initiatives uh, outside of the broadcast. Um, so welcome to our talk. Uh, we will be going over a lot of the kind of business uh, forces driving our decision to switch CMS. Uh, obviously, uh, going, changing CMSs is not a small and trivial project. Uh, and uh, we, we spend a lot of time preparing and looking into uh, what's needed uh, for a long-term successful uh, transition. Uh, let's see. First, a quick overview of where we stand. Uh, I can barely see the background there, but uh, we started out obviously as a, a live news network. Uh, we currently now have uh, seven live broadcast channels uh, and uh, eight, over 80 bureaus uh, worldwide uh, doing collecting reports. Uh, we, a few years back, we switched over to uh, focus more on the digital aspects, and now we are at about uh, you know, a, a lot of monthly page views, a lot of monthly active users, uh, over 50 digital products uh, across uh, a, number, a number of platforms, uh, and many, many languages, as you can imagine. Uh, so over time, it became uh, apparent that you know, more and more digital platforms are going to be growing and popping up, and uh, our budget isn't kind of uh, scaling at the same rate as uh, users and, uh, uh, and platforms are. So we needed to begin to figure out how to do more with, uh, with less. And that really kind of uh, kicked off uh, an internal ADO initiative. And uh, that is a lot of corporate speak for basically trying to figure out ways to optimize how we spend our investment uh, on specifically technology and how those technologies uh, can support multiple processes uh, that uh, support a lot of the people doing the work of getting the news uh, and, and writing the news and put, putting out the news. Um, more specifically on the ADO tracks are uh, probably nine uh, major buckets. Uh, at the top there you'll see uh, more consumer facing uh, uh, tracks from uh, video and live streaming, uh, mobility platform, social engagement, and then uh, all of the analytics uh, uh, behind that to support it, video monitoring, uh, asset management is obviously going to be a very large piece of that. And then uh, behind the scenes, kind of more infrastructural pieces like uh, our content management system and uh, the service buses and APIs uh, across multiple departments and systems to support that. And then there's this last one that we just call assessment services. Mostly it's kind of like an internal consulting group that uh, from time to time looks at, looks at how we're performing and how our investments are doing over time. But for this talk, uh, it's mostly on the content management track. Um, so uh, because we grew up uh, from a broadcast world, each, uh, channels, uh, uh, each channel basically had their own website. So we had an Arabic website, we had an uh, English website, we at one point had an American website. Uh, and they were all custom built systems, internal. Uh, they each had their own different workflows. And you can imagine that over time, uh, we had to constantly add more and more things to all of these systems. So uh, RSS support, uh, responsive, uh, mobile pages, uh, different types of security. And uh, each of them have their different workflows to support the news gathering and publishing process uh, for each channel. Uh, so someone working in uh, one, one property that cannot easily switch over and help out on a different property to, to, to write a story or to put out a story or do some investigative piece um, because the tools were very, very different. And add to that, you have your uh, overhead for you know, your support, uh, your, <laughs> your, your, your product management, both for the consumer-facing side, uh, which, are, which are you guys, and then the client facing, which are our editorial teams and the different UI looks. Um, and that is a kind of high level overview of all the problems that we talked about. Uh, add to this that you know, if we wanted to pick up a new initiative, let's say I wanted to do uh, uh, AMP mobile pages, um, I would have to basically do that five different times or six different times for every single property, I would have to add that functionality in. 
and obviously that doesn't scale uh, as, we, as we look ahead. <coughs> so what do you do to kind of start gathering all of these problems together and figuring out what to, uh, uh, where to go from there? Uh, we, we looked at the end-to-end -end kind of content lifecycle uh, from how we capture content all the way to how we uh, publish it out and review it and see how it's performing. Uh, we did a ton of interviews internally. We talked to a lot of uh, groups uh, and figured out what their needs were and uh, came up with a fairly complex set of requirements. I think that, that requirements doc came out to somewhere in the range of, I don't know, 200 some odd pages. It was not a, a, an easy afternoon read. Uh, <laughs> <they're>, uh, <coughs> but I think high, uh, you know, h high level takeaways are that we needed a very flexible platform to support the different types of workflows, highly configurable. Um, you know, control over all content streams, architecture accommodates different types of structured content, and interface to support uh, the content editors in different, different languages. And uh, that's kind of, <laughs> when, you, when you take all those uh, requirements in, into consideration, there aren't many products out in the market that can do all of that. Um, Drupal w became very quickly a, a short list for us, uh, and uh, when you really kind of dig down into like what's really enterprise ready, high, highly customizable, uh, strong multiple language support, uh, being able to have a multi-tenant, multi-site uh, uh, configuration on a single rollout platform, uh, you, you, you run out of, you know, you start crossing off the, the available options very quickly. Uh, so Drupal really was a very natural choice for us uh, when looking at what was available. And really Drupal 8 because, I mean, <coughs> I think we didn't want to go down uh, with a large investment and then have to consider down the road to have to uh, do, a, do a fairly significant site upgrade uh, to, Drupal, to Drupal 8. And uh, uh, really I think at the time that we started our investment uh, uh, initiative to kick off this project, uh, Drupal 8 kind of showed a lot of maturity uh, beyond what was available in Drupal 7. And uh, so that's where we ended up. So I'm going to go over some of the key features of the platform. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the lightning distribution, internationalization, um, asset and li uh, content lifecycle management, and then we're going to end with how we handled uh, content distribution. So the Lightning dis distribution was incredibly useful uh, in expediting our platform implementation. So we used Lightning as a springboard for developing because it came with a lot of, of um, the required functionality out of the box, um, which definitely cut down on time and cost of development for Al Jazeera. So what is Lightning? So Lightning is a lightweight Drupal distribution. It's maintained by Acquia. Um, it's intended to cover, right, the kind of 20% of a typical use cases of like a site. So it's serving as a starting point that you're building on top of. So um, these kind of things are like page layout, previewing your content before publishing it, content workflow and approvals, and managing assets. So if you look at the distributions that are out there in the ecosystem, so Lightning is sitting somewhere, right, in the middle of a fra like a framework type distribution like Panoply, um, and a full kind of out of the box product distribution like um, Berta's Thunder. Okay, so we chose Lightning um, because it had these great great baseline um, features that matched well with Al Jazeera's uh, requirements. So specifically, these things were like using Panelizer for page layouts, content workflow and media management. They had a reliable um, and transparent roadmap. Um, it's linked there. Um, and they hit the milestones that um, they set out. So that's very important, right, for our planning of this project. Um, just a side note, the general lease for Lightning was uh, July 19th of this year, in case you're interested. Um, the maintainers are also quite active um, in the Drupal-Lightning IRC channel. So thanks to, big thanks to John Kennedy, Adam Balsama, Adam Glovis Honig right there um, for their support. Um, so if you choose Lightning, there are 
you know, kind of like three approaches to building on top of this functionality. The approach we went with for this platform is the third one. So we are using a patch, right, that is allowing an install profile to inherit from a parent profile. So um, now I'm going to talk about like the next, we're going to go into the next feature here, which is internationalization. And Tien um, is going to talk about the importance of this qu quite core requirement. <laughs> yeah. Uh, internationalization, super important, super, super important. We have uh, uh, 80 bureaus. We work in uh, five different languages uh, and uh, supporting over 80, pro uh, excuse me, 50 different digital products. Um, and more specifically, I think if you think about internationalization, if you only consider things like uh, Spanish, French, English, uh, it's fine, but we have the added complexity of uh, doing a right to left language like Arabic. And when you introduce that, it actually adds a lot of other uh, UX uh, impacts that you have to take into consideration. Uh, uh, where, where do you even place icons? Uh, the way that people naturally read dates or naturally read uh, 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 when, when they think about searching what they're with in their mind what their taxonomy is because that's the language that they default to think of so uh, it adds it, it adds quite a number of, of other considerations and uh, when we when we set out to do Drupal we wanted to make sure that uh, there was a very robust set of modules available for us to to extend on um, my will go into those details yeah, so like how many of you guys have known the pain of configuring, right, a D7 multilingual site? Like how many? Yeah, yeah, there are a lot of pain points here, right? So I'm just going to highlight a couple real quick here. So the first being like you probably needed to stitch together a lot of modules that may or may not have had the same kind of technical approach, and you're including some patches in the mix. The administration UI was kind of complicated, their settings sprinkled everywhere, um, and there's kind of like a manual process for updating your locales. So if this was the past, right, like today's awesomeness brings a lot to the table with just core alone, thanks to all of the efforts of um, the D8 multilingual initiative and the whole idea, the concept of putting language first, right? So the needs for Al Jazeera's baseline platform was more focused on internationalization as opposed to content translation. So these requirements were covered by enabling and configuring two core modules, language and interface translation. So there are a ton of features from D8MI. I'm just going to highlight a few here. The first being language handling, right? which allows us to natively install in 94 languages. Very important for Al Jazeera's platform because they needed to support, as Tien was saying, uh, non-English language as a system default language, and as well as that right to, um, sorry, right to left orientation. So the interface translation uh, module also kind of revamps that whole administration um, experience. So there's less intuitive clicks um, unintuitive clicks for editing your string overrides and the um, locale updates are kind of using are using the same process as the you know the update module for handling like um, updates. Um, other cool features include field level configurability for your content and views is integrated so that's that's super awesome, right? Um, so, what's really cool is that all your configuration is translatable. So, if you have a foreign language installed, you can create configuration in that language. Um, the same thing applies, like if you know you're adding additional languages later. So, as Chris and Paul's um, quote illustrates, we have a significant reduction in the complexity of supporting multilingual concerns in D8. So, there's. Two other modules that I didn't mention that are coming from Core, mostly because they're talking about this translation piece, but versus uh, configuration translation. So that's allowing you to, um, allowing blocks and menu views to be translatable. So it's kind of similar to the internationalization module in D7. And the other is um, content translation. So uh, making things like nodes or comments, taxonomy terms translatable. So you know, bringing in some of that like functionality that was existing in the entity translation. 
model and peace center. So um, there's, I'm definitely posting these slides um, to the session node and also tweeting them out so you can explore most, more of these resources. I highly recommend it. Big thanks to over 1,200, over 1,200 contributors who have gotten us this far. It's, it's amazing. So um, the next section that we're going to go into is media management because, you know, one of the core requirements was this internationalization piece, right? We're talking about a media company. So asset management is super crucial. So Tian is going to speak to that for a second. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of what we do, media <laughs> management. Uh, and I need to review my notes because they are, there's a lot there. <laughs> um, being able to kind of manage media in a, in, a opti in, a, in a not crazy fashion is really important to maintaining our sanity over, uh, for all of our editors. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we had a single hub where all of this content from various networks can uh, get into and make sure that that has uh, access for all of our editors. Uh, it also streamlines a lot of things like rights management, clearance, reusability. Uh, it also helps us optimize storage. Um, and more importantly than that, it's, uh, it's just critical for making sure that the left hand knows what the right hand is doing. If somebody's working on a particular story, if somebody's working on a, uh, 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 I don't know, a, a breaking news piece, uh, the, other, the other editors would, should, should know that this is happening. And sometimes the reverse is important as well, uh, which is if you're working on a very sensitive investigative piece, uh, you don't want the rest of the network to know that that's happening. Um, and making sure that you have the kind of right kind of barriers and, uh, and boundaries in, uh, around your work project is very, very important. Um, so I'm going to give that, pass that over to Mai, who's actually going to talk about uh, a bunch of the Drupal specific pieces like uh, file entity, media entity, browser, entity browsers, and entity embeds, which I know nothing of. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this section might be a little intense. Um, <coughs> I kind of wanted to go into a little bit of detail here because it, it, we're dealing with configuration entities a little bit in this piece, so um, don't worry. Um, it's going to be fine if you weren't prepared for this. <laughs> but um, first, I kind of wanted to talk about like some background information on media management in D7 since it's going to be relevant here. Um, so like our, a lot of you are familiar probably with the media module, right, in D7? I've seen a lot of heads nodding. Cool. So, I mean, the, the goal of this um, whole effort was to kind of deal with the chaos of D6 media management, right? It was bringing to the table this, like, two-tiered API. And, uh, you know, maybe you also use Scald or Asset for MediaBox. But I'm going to focus on media module here for a bit because um, I want to talk about the file entity piece. Um, so we've got this two-tiered API, a resource manager, that's creating this unified media storage and this extensible browser for editors. So, you know, this is kind of dealing with, you know, you're managing your files, your assets, regardless of whether you're uploading them locally or they're a reference to a remote file like a YouTube video. Um, so if we take a look at this stack here from D7, we've got, um, Drupal 7 core is bringing this file entity, right? And the file entity is expanding, is extending that API um, to make them fieldable and provide view modes. Um, and then on top, like, not on top, but like bringing those four layers underneath is the media module and it's providing that extensible media browser. It's integrating views, it's bringing WYSIWYG integration in here. Um, and the reason why I'm talking about this stack is because the file entity module exists in D8. Um, and there's also this media entity module. Um, and Lightning is using media entity, by the way. But, you know, um, these are basically two different solutions for media storage in Contrib. And I wanted to cover this because it took me a little bit to kind of understand the difference here. Um, so I'm going to just cover this real quick. So these are two different entities that exist. Both of these storage solutions 
work with the other components in the media ecosystem. So like the whole idea is to have these decoupled components as opposed to a monolithic solution. So both of them generally work okay with um, NC browser, which I'll talk about more in detail in a second, and NC embed. And um, so, so yeah, what is file entity? So just like seven, we're extending from the cores file entity. And it's basically kind of like treating everything like a file. Um, at high level, media entity is bringing a new entity type called media. Um, and it's not necessarily assuming that every asset they're adding is a file. Um, Lightning Media um, is using the media entity. So it comes with support. Um, this media feature comes with support for documents, images, Instagram embeds tweet embeds, and also video. So our stack look like this. We've got our feature module kind of extending from what the platform is offering, I mean, what the uh, distribution is offering. Um, and then, as I said before, it's got a dependency on media entity, and it's bringing these different bundles into the picture. We also had a requirement for audio, so that's why we brought that in, and these other kind of video dependencies. So let's take an example of like, what is this media bundle? Let's explore. So I'm gonna walk through the configuration of a tweet media bundle that's provided by Lightning, just an example. So first off, where is it? It's under structure, media bundles. You can have, you know, you see all your bundles uh, available. We're gonna look at the tweet one. Um, and, sorry. And then we can see the type provider is Twitter. And we've got this field here, tweet. So what is this field? We can see that this is just a plain long text field and it's gonna be containing the tweet embed code. And then if we check out the manage display tab, we can see the tweet field is using this Twitter embed format that's provided by the media entity Twitter bundle. So we just talked about the setup of this example bundle here. Let's talk about how we would use it. So we can browse or add these kind of media assets to our system using something like Entity Browser, and we can kind of connect this Entity Browser so that we can embed them um, you know, in a rich text field by using something like Entity Embed. Um, so first off, let's unpack Entity Browser. So this is a flexible and generic browser and selection tool for entities. Note I'm saying entity, so this is not media specific. So remember in the media module, you had a media browser, so it's kind of like that, but it's for generic entities. Um, where is it? It's under admin content authoring entity browser. You can create multiple entity browsers. So we're gonna walk through um, Lightning's media browser setup. So when you create and edit um, an entity browser, you're kind of taken through this multi-step configuration form. And it's really intense, so I'm gonna kind of go through it. So first off, an entity browser is a configuration entity. It's bringing in all these different pl plugins that we're gonna explore together. Um, and the first plugin is this browser display. Um, this is controlling how the browser is appearing to the editor. So you can see uh, Lightning Media uh, Browser is using the iframe, but other options are modal, um, standalone form. So you know some example use cases here if you're rolling out your own entity browser. Um, maybe your WYSIWYG button, like, right, your entity embed button. Might wanna use a modal display. Um, or you could use iframe. But, you know, here's some examples. If you have a field widget, um, you could use an iframe display. Um, if you have a system that's pushing content to a third party system, a standalone form might be useful. Um, next, we've got this entity selector widget. So this is controlling how the editor is accessing these different like ways to kind of select or reference their entities. So some options are tab, drop down, uh, buttons, and then you have the option to configure the entity selection display. So um, this is handling the display and logic around currently selected, selected entities. Lightning is keeping it simple. Um, they don't have a selection display set However, if you had a more complicated like workflow for editors where they need to like create a bunch of entities, 
reference some entities, kind of like had that last step where they're reviewing everything that they've selected and want to reference, then you might want to configure this selection display plugin. So the next step in this uh, form is just some additional configuration for your browser display plugin. Um, in this case, since uh, no selection display was set for the entity selection display, we don't have anything to configure here for the widget selector or the selection display. And now the last screen is, is the fun part, the browser widget. So um, these are different ways you can create or reference your entities. So say you want to kind of browse what is existing on the system and then select a bunch of them. Maybe you want to use a view for that. Um, say you're uploading images to the system, right? A file upload widget. Um, there's also other options like an inline entity form. Lightning Media brings, I'm sorry, Lightning brings um, uh, a custom embed code widget here that you see in the bottom. And it's got this kind of logic in the background that allows an editor to drop in a tweet embed code, Instagram embed code, and there's logic in the background that's figure out which bundle, media bundle to assign it to. Okay, so when after you, you know, set up your entity browser, you might want to connect it to a nice little WYSIWYG button so that you can embed these entities in your WYSIWYG um, editor. Um, so entity embed is uh, the module you would look at. So uh, where is it? Configuration, content authoring, text editor embed buttons. When you add a new entity embed button, um, you're going to select the entity type um, after you give it a name. And once you select the entity type, it's probably en uh, embed type, sorry, it's used, you're going to select entity. You can select which type of entity. Here I'm selecting file. Given options for the display plugins, here is where you're connecting the entity browser. Um, and then here I'm just showing how to connect it to your text format. So we're going to add it to the basic HTML text format, dragging this E. This is just a, the initial setup. If you add an icon, it will show an icon here. You're going to drag it to your active toolbar. And then, um, yeah, I had some trouble there. Um, then you're going to make sure that display embedded entities filter is checked. And then also make sure that you're not you're allowing those tags uh, for the entity embed. Okay, so this is kind of what Lightning looks like um, for out of the box. So we've got those tabs. I'm just going through because we went through so much configuration. We kind of want to see it in action, right? Here are my cats. They're lovely, pancake and ketchup. It's pretty streamlined, like kind of setup. Here is the embed code piece that I was talking about. So I'm grabbing. A little tweet embed code. What's nice is this save to my media library piece. Um, and then we can see the result, right, as it's rendered. So um, another kind of requirement of the platform was to support video. And I said that Lightning comes with support for video. But um, this was more like YouTube uh, videos and things like that. We had a specific requirement for for Brightcove videos. Um, so we use the Brightcove Video Connect module. Um, so if you think about like an editor's workflow here. So Drupal is serving as the front end for Brightcove's API. So you know an editor would go in, upload their video um, in Drupal, right? And then eventually it would be synced back to Brightcove. Um, you can also add um, additional metadata or moderation states and have this sync back to Brightcode. So I just want to give a shout out to Provenix and Kristoff because we had some great conversations with them um, when we were looking at this Brightcode module. Specifically, I want to point out um, this really cool um, tutorial that kind of steps you through all of the configuration you need to like know about to use this. So now, we're going to go to our next section here about editor work, editorial workflow. So I'm going to hand it off to Tian, who's going to give us the 
who's going to turn on his mic, and then he's yeah. going to tell you all, all about the business case. Uh, yeah, editorial workflow. Um, doesn't really get more important to this. Don't pay attention to the other two pieces. <laughs> this is really important. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> we're kind of in the business of telling stories, and uh, I mentioned that we have editors working in various different products, and each team, uh, kind of like a developer, they, you know, today I'm working with team A, tomorrow I'm working with team B, and they all have their different kind of flows and processes to get a story out. So we really need a system that uh, can uh, have a, a, a large degree of flexibility where we can configure different workflows and make sure that it doesn't kind of uh, uh, reproduce steps and, and just give the minimum number of uh, steps necessary to, to get a story out correctly. But we also need to add in the right amount of rigidness uh, so that their uh, senior editors can uh, fact check and make sure that we don't get anything wrong. And w if we do make a mistake and publish something out, uh, we can retract it quickly. Uh, all of that is to say that none of this should uh, stand in the way of getting, uh, of allowing our editors to tell the story properly and making sure that uh, our audiences uh, get the news. So really kind of a, a do or die type of uh, uh, vertical, I would say. <laughs> so, okay, so how do we address these requirements in the time frame that we had? Um, once again, we're leveraging the baseline functionality coming from Lightning, specifically the Lightning workflow feature. And this is what the stack kind of looks like. Again, we have our custom like feature module um, that's extending what Lightning uh, workflow is bringing to the table, which has a dependency on workbench moderation. So Lightning comes with uh, draft, needs review, publish, and archive out of the box. We had um, additional kind of transitions that needed to be added, as well as an, another state called recalled. Um, so this is just a diagram illustrating Al Jazeera's um, content moderation states. Um, we also implemented a tab um, that displays a history of the, of the moderation states for a given node. So the idea behind this was to see, you know, allow it to be uh, allow editors to like easily see approvals and rejections of content before publishing it. And and this is a, a view um, that is using a contextual filter. Um, of the revision ID to display this information. Uh, we also determine that, you know, given the timeline and, timeline and scope, um, content moderation and user permissions were two key areas that would definitely benefit from some automated testing since it, it's kind of like a tedious experience for um, quality assurance as we are adding more and more functionality to the system. So luckily, Lightning comes with a whole host of BHAT tests. Um, so for those of you who don't, aren't familiar with you know, what BHAT is, BHAT is a, a behavioral driven automated testing framework. So like in English, um, this is, you're writing your testing steps in plain English and you, know, you would kind of describe these steps in a similar way to like how you would test it manually and then there's logic in PHP that's you know supporting these these steps that using this BHAT framework. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the final component of the platform, content distribution. Um, to start, Tien is going to cover the goals of this portion. Uh, yeah, content distribution. Everything we invested in earlier doesn't mean jack if we can't. <laughs> We can't get it out the door, so uh, super duper important to us. Um, really, uh, this is kind of uh, making sure that we can get the content, like I said, out the door and reaching our customers and, and then better understanding how it's doing and how it's performing and then customizing that down the road. Um, your typical uh, questions that are going to come up here are, you know, what was published, when was it published, where was it published to, which platforms did they include, who did it, uh, how did it perform, and how do we get better next time. Um, <clears throat> it really is kind of that last three buckets there uh, that distribute engage and review uh, in our content lifecycle. 
and uh, we'll touch up on, I think Mai is gonna touch up on some uh, previously, uh, previously talked about topics like the content hub, which plays another important role here, uh, making sure that uh, depending on where you, which property you publish out on, um, you can still access the same, the, the same content hub and reference the same content and make sure that any changes you make on one uh, gets propagated out to the other places. So, Mai? Um, so Al Jazeera required multiple CMSs to connect to a basic content hub as part of the platform. Um, additionally, in order to support you know, this editor collaboration and visibility that Tian was ta just talking about, um, we also developed an editor discovery dashboard, um, which was set up on each of these CMS instances. So this was kind of mentioned you know, earlier in the media discussion, um, but I'm gonna go into depth, uh, more into depth in this piece here. So, um, you know, on a CMS, we've got um, a few blocks here. Um, first of all, as an editor, I should see what recent content has been added to the instance that I'm logged into. I should also be able to see my recent content that's on the instance that I've been logged into. And additionally, I need to see the recent content that's been pushed to this content repository. Um, and so, you know, this is, these are the three blocks. This is on a, a panel page, so using a panelizer. Um, and let me go into the content repository piece here. So we have CMS instances pushing content on content creation, um, edit, deletion, to this repository instance. And then, you know, we had that custom block that's showing the recent content on the repository on these connected CMS instances. So how, what, how did that like, come about? So, you know, this custom block is basically uh, leveraging core REST API um, and we've got, um, on the repository of view that's using the REST export, and we like added a little, uh, we, we altered um, a little bit to include this basic auth so we could kind of protect that connection. So content repository and these connected instances, how do we kind of like manage this? So we're using deploy, multi-version, replication and relaxed web services to kind of push the content from the target to the source. Um, so what is deploy? So deploy is, has been rewritten from its D7 version to just kind of provide this UI on top of workspace and uh, replication modules, which I'll talk about in a second. But this UI, if you're thinking about it, is like allowing you to manage this content deployment between workspaces on um, a single site um, in Al Jazeera's case, we're doing um, cross-site deployments, so from one work site from CMS A to the content repository, right? Um, and we had to, you know, add some additional alter like implement some alter hooks so that we could like do this on node update and delete, et cetera. Um, that part doesn't come out of deploy, like out of the um, so let me give you a brief overview of the pieces of the deploy suite that I mentioned on um, that like icon slide. So first off, we have multi-version. So this module is doing three things. It's, it's, it's adding revision support to all your content entities. Um, it's introducing this concept of parent revisions so you can kind of create these different branches. Um, of content. And then it's tracking the conflicts in your revision tree. So like when two revisions are sharing the same parent. So if you're thinking about like a Git uh, revision kind of history, it's kind of like in that kind of mindset. So on top of multi-version, we've got the replication module. So this is a lightweight module that's using that, this reading this revision information that's like being produced by multi-version. And um, it's using that to determine you know, 
which revisions are missing from you know, a given location and it's allowing you to like replicate this content between your source and your target. So, all right, so in the real world, like a real world example, so a writer who is working on multiple properties, like a news site, an opinion site, you know, maybe they're you know, doing human's rights page. Um, this kind of architecture and the setup and including the relaxed kind of stuff that I'm going to talk about in the, in the next slide, it means that they can kind of shift in working in different teams but still be able to access their full portfolio of work wherever, whichever instance they're logging into. Um, so then we've got this concept of workspace. Um, this is, you know, al allowing you to have um, content staging and full site previews. So we're using this. We're just having single workspaces on uh, Al Jazeera's platform, uh, and we're using Relax Web Services to serve the bridge between the connected instances. Um, so Relax Web Services is bringing like a more extensive REST API. So it's supporting UUIDs, translations, file attachments, parent revisions, right? So it's, it's um, you know, align that connection. So, uh, you know, why do we choose deploy? So, you no, know, this is another kind of great baseline solution that we needed to build on top of. We um, ha had the ability to restore deleted content gave us the ability to kind of like get ready to, you know, push changes from these connected CMS instances to the target content repository. And very interestingly, like a lot of these pieces are, you know, being considered for moving into core as part of this workflow initiative. Um, also, um, things like uh, multi-version, replication, and the workspace are also being planned for inclusion in a future lightning release to support more content, you know, preview, staging, kind of archiving your site state. So that's, that's kind of interesting as well, I think. Um, so to just recap here, so we went through all the stacks. So we've got CMSA, we've got this multi-version, working with replication, dealing with a single workspace, relaxed web services is providing that bridge, we got a similar stack on the content repository. So I mentioned um, earlier about like this workflow initiative. So what is it? Um, so the idea is to improve content workflow and preview and content staging by kind of extending the entity API, kind of taking these pieces from these different modules, also like workbench moderation. The roadmap is, is pretty humongous. Um, it uh, is quite an ambitious initiative. They've done a ton of work already on it. Um, one thing that, you know, when I was going, when I went to the, um, the workflow initiative uh, session yesterday, um, I saw that they are um, creating this uh, module called content moderation as an experimental module as part of core, um, kind of, uh, first of all, it was, a, it rewrote a little bit of the workbench moderation, so it was allowing it to be uninstallable and like folding in these kind of revisioning pieces. Um, so that's pretty, pretty interesting um, and, and, and cool. So there's some more information here. Um, when you look at the initiative, you'll be like, wow, there are so many phases, hitting all the way to like 8.5 as a target. Um, but I highly encourage you to check out um, Dree's um, blog post, uh, kind of like talking about like why we're, we're thinking about this. This is an extremely hard problem to deal with, especially as part of folding it into core. It's very like difficult when we get into this whole revisioning um, business. Um, so, but anyway, check these resources out if you're interested. Um, and uh, yeah. So, you know, now um, we're just going to kind of start wrapping up here. Um, and Tian is going to talk about some of the platform features that are planned for future iterations. So, thank you. Um, yeah, a lot to, to go through. Uh, I think each of these uh, uh, topics that we've covered 
you know, given that this is a one-star discussion, we, we kind of flew through a lot of uh, <laughs> content. And uh, I think each of them deserve like a full deep dive conversation uh, in the future. Uh, but looking ahead, <clears throat> um, you know, we still have to migrate our existing content uh, from all of our CMSs over to this new Drupal platform that we're building uh, with phase two. So uh, there, will be, uh, there will be a need for a taxonomy, man taxonomy manager uh, to change uh, the structured data that's stored in one database into uh, Drupal style uh, content. Uh, we still have to do the data migration there, aspects of it. Uh, there are going to be future uh, mobile specific features that haven't, we haven't included as this uh, baseline development. And uh, we haven't even touched up on uh, personalization yet, which is, um, it's, it's a very, very deep rabbit hole. <laughs> so uh, there's that. Um, and you know, so far it's been uh, very productive working with, with phase two. Uh, I think we're, what, we've, what we've developed so far has, has, uh, is definitely in the right direction. Uh, it is a very, very large project as you can imagine. Uh, and uh, we're still learning a lot uh, uh, as, as, as we go along. Um, things like um, an open source, working on an open source platform, uh, uh, referring to the community modules list, uh, or we're working on Docker. Uh, Drupal 8 is new, I think, just uh, in general. Um, and, then, and then not to mention all of the other uh, uh, performance issues and, and uh, uh, scalability issues that we're going to hit once we start rolling it out live. Yeah, and just some, uh, oh. yeah, I'm gonna add to this. Um, just like some other kind of perspectives, lessons learned pieces. So, um, so one of the things that I think, you know, coming from like the develop developer side, right? One of the things that we did with this project um, is we had a lot of open communication. We were, we had like these things called sprint reviews, and the sprint reviews also had the demo, and it's okay. I just want to like when I was first like thinking about this, I was like, oh my god, I got to demo this. I'm not ready. I gotta, if, you know, say it wasn't pushed to like, you know, uh, the dev instance or whatever, I had to demo it locally, right? Like as a developer, you're kind of like taking a moment to stop and kind of make sure you're set up for the demo. Um, but one of the things that I kind of learned from this experience is like, that really was quite key um, because we were able to get immediate feedback um, and everybody was on the same page, right? Nobody's like having different assumptions on like what's being worked on. We could kind of like um, surface any kind of mis like doubts or you know things that we're thinking about um, for a particular feature and and talk through it. So I think that was like really really important as part of this project process, um, even though it's like anxiety producing to kind of demo. <laughs> um, and another thing, um, you know, as you're uh, kind of, you're, you're, you know, developing these custom modules, um, yes, we have, we have like these um, annotations and all these comments everywhere, but um, I think it's also really key, and I've seen this like for other projects, that I've um, been working on to have like a README file in um, your custom module to like kind of give the next developer who's gonna come along like the gist so that they don't have to read through everything. And also, you know, highlight anything that's like, okay, this is, you know, the reason why and why this is being done custom and like what are some key points, like we're creating this plugin and it's doing this, da 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 da, right? So I feel like adding that additional documentation as part of handoff is, is really key. I, I appreciate it as a developer, and I'm sure you appreciate it. When you look at contrib modules that have that extra information in the readme, you're like, oh, thank God. Um, so so that's, that's just something that I wanted to mention. Um, so, you know, before we go to questions, I um, just wanted to highlight that there are these contrib contribution sprints happening um, all day, but also especially on Fridays, so if you can make it, um, 
there's a first time sprinter workshop, there's mentored core work, uh, sprints, and then general sprints for like, you know, whatever kind of a topic that you're interested in. But definitely encourage you to get involved. Um, and, uh, you know, um, please evaluate this session. Um, your honest feedback is uh, most, most appreciated and, and valued. So I, I beg, <laughs> I ask that you, um, you know, review our session. So I guess, um, you know, we have about 10 minutes or so. I guess we'll open it up for some Q&A. And please use the mic. It's in the middle. Thank you. What are your plans for uh, front page editing, article sorting, and stuff like that? Time. Front page editing. Sure. What are you uh, where I come from in Norway, uh, the you know using a WYSIWYG ish uh, front page editing tool is critical. You know. I would I, sorry, so I don't think we want to so much do WYSIWYG. I mean there are uh, specific templates that are uh, outlined for our home page that um, you want to promote uh, over time you want to promote uh, muscle memory of where certain menu options are going to be and where certain aspects are, uh, you know, top swords are always going to be on the right side or on the left side or whatever that is, right? So we don't want to make major layout changes. That being said, uh, um, there are, you know, uh, high level, top level templates that we use. So if it's a breaking news day, there are certain, there's a very specific layout for it, if, 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 uh, if, if a plane got shot down, oh, that's terrible, but whatever it is, uh, we, we do use those major type of templates so that uh, you can have, let's say, uh, a lead story and then maybe two or three uh, analysis pieces around that. Uh, or uh, if it's just a, a regular news day, you would have maybe, uh, you would weight it more equally along with some multimedia content. Does that answer your question? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> so it means you won't really uh, be able to like edit uh, uh, a node title on the front page or er like remove the teaser and make the image bigger, <coughs> stuff like that. It's a fine balance between, um, you know, the, the you, you don't want the editor to kind of uh, run away with, with, with the general layout of the site and the, and the general look and feel of the site, right? We, we, we have designers that, that spend a lot of time in UX uh, folks and, and doing user, user research to figure out what kind of fonts work, where certain uh, elements need to lie on the page to get uh, the right type of attention. So. Um, we don't want to prevent the editor to make uh, important changes as needed, but at the same time, uh, it has to have an overall structure in terms of, uh, inf of, of conveying information over time. Are you asking about edit in place? Is that what you're asking about on the front <coughs> page? Uh, not really. Uh, okay. With our media customers, we have built uh, uh, Angular application on top of Drupal mm -hmm. that handles all that, so you can drag in articles and sort them and stuff like that. And what we see is that all at least in Scandinavia, all the big news sites, they allow for, you know, making the promos for articles very different from the actual article. So you, you change the titles, you change the images, you tweak the font sizes and tweak the layouts and stuff like that. So, um, so well, I guess what I'm saying is, if you came to a news site page and every day it looked completely different, it would be an awful user experience. And we have to balance that with, uh, I think, the highlighting important pieces that do come out and making sure that um, uh, the, the, the platform has flexibility to do that. So I think it is a core requirement that we have that capability, but we certainly don't want editors to just willy-nilly go in and start changing things on the fly. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, uh, my question is about the um, distribution. Uh, since it's lightning, Say if you want to put your own stuff on the top of it, mm -hmm. how do you do? Did you fork lightning or use out of the box and? Um, so let me go back to the slide here. Sorry. Because I, I came a little bit late. I might have missed something. Yeah. No let problem. Me just <laughs> try to find the slide. I think these quick. are all recorded as well. So. Um, sorry, it's many slides back. So there are three approaches, right, for how you would kind of build on top of it, and I'm trying to find it. Um, here we go. So um, one, 
would be to like build on top of it, like you would for a product, it should be shared. Another would be to use the extend.yaml file. Um, and you know, these slides will be posted. Okay, so yeah, you can I'll like access soon. these links, but there's an example kind of implementation where you kind of use the YAML file to say, okay, I want these kind of enabled. The, the method that we used for this platform was using this patch that allows us to inherit from a, a base, like a parent profile. Oh, okay, and is your code like open source? Is it public or is not really? No. No, okay. <laughs> and um, say if they put new functionalities on the Lightning, something that S you sorry, don't want. Sorry, I just want to say, <coughs> generally speaking, no, but um, where it makes sense to re to contribute back to the community, we are we are actively looking into places to, to open source it. Yeah, but this particular distribution. I think my question is more like yeah. uh, to see your setup. What's that? To see how, how you did, how you put everything together. Uh-huh. Like, yeah, of course, <laughs> I guess, no. Um, so say if they put new functionalities on the, on the lightning that you don't want, how do you deal with that? Because you're gonna inherit all that stuff, right? Yeah, so, I mean, if you're creating your own, like, install profile, you can like control what's enabled. Um, so you can like, I mean, even if you're like kind of spinning lightning up um, like on simply testing, right? If you're going through the install screen, you can see that these things like lightning media or lightning workflow, those features are optional to install. So you can have the same approach in your um, install profile setup. Um, maybe I'm missing something here. So you have your own Install profile yeah, using so Lightning we, as profile? We created, right, uh, install profile. Based on Lightning. That is using, so in, for example, like Open Atrium, right, like in D7, we are using, like for projects that are using that, we're using a similar kind of patch, it was for seven, to kind of say like, okay, I want Open Atrium um, to be my kind of like parent base profile but then I want to kind of extend what's coming out from that. I want to build on top of that. So in my install profile, I'm choosing which modules to, to be enabled when it's installed. And then, you know, in seven, you know, you had these other things like feature overrides and things like that. But like here, you know, we added, you know, our own feature modules that are like, yeah, I have a dependency on Lightning Media feature, for example. Um, so it's all those pieces kind of stitched together. But yeah, it's in your install profile. Nice, thanks. Yeah. <coughs> Hello, my name is Andre Baumeyer. I'm currently working for Burger. And we are having a similar stack using Thunder. And I got a particular question regarding um, what tools you use. Are you currently moving everything on top of Drupal or are you still implementing and using third parties or third party softwares like media managing solution, media distribution stuff in that direction for video images, or for videos, for instance, or is it all in Drupal? So the video, for example, like is, like these videos are Brightcode videos, right? So we're using a module to, the Brightcode yeah. Video Connect module to like provide that interface. So yeah, that part, like the media part is being handled in Drupal. Okay, um, do you, is it live already? Are you using it, or are you still in the rollout process? Still in development. Okay. Yeah. How how long are you working on this? Oh, long? a long time. I, okay. I I I don't want to say, but uh, oh, the it's planning phase. Yeah, That's I mean, why. there's there's a lot there's a lot there. Like I said, we started out with something like a 200 page document of of just high level <laughs> requirements. So it was there's a lot to go through. Okay. And one last question regarding the content hub. Um, is it like Every instance of um, your page has all the um, content it displayed completely in it, including all the revisions and all the media assets, or is it uh, still saved in the content hub and just referenced to it? Also for the distribution part, like is an image distributed to an instance and then um, displayed there, and do you have caches and varnish and whatever there goes on that stuff, or is it in the content hub so referenced to there? We don't have a caching layer set up right now because it's a baseline pro, uh, uh, platform that's currently being built on and sites are in progress for, for building on top of that. Um, so the revisioning piece, all right, so like it's not like we're having multiple copies of like 
snapshots of each node, right? Like, so it's just like the changes that have happened for each revision. Those are being pushed and, and stored like these, um, the revision kind of tree and all the stuff, the UID, but this is being pushed to the, to the content repository. Um, that includes like um, uh, the, the, you know, if there are translate, well, there's no translations here, but like that includes um, the, the media piece as well, media references. Okay, cool, thanks. Hello. Um, my question is about the channel pages, and channel pages. Uh, yes, okay. channel pages. And so, the, um, one part of qu the first part of the question will be of um, how much automation is important to you. Of course, assume that most part of the channel pages are uh, generated automatically. Um, but about the manual part, how important was it to you to improve the user experience for the editors, so they could place uh, stories on specific positions? Um, do you have some specific uh, drag and drop in place or um, live preview in place for those channel pages? Yeah, I mean, we do want to do a uh, live preview. Um, and sorry, repeat the first part, because I'm not familiar with wha so like what, the what the, the scope of a child page is in, in Drupal uh, World. So a, a channel page to me is, uh, well, the landing page, obviously, or politics, mm -hmm. or I don't know, um, sports. Okay. So those oh, are channel, channel pages. Channel pages. Channel pages, okay. yes. Channel, channel pages. pages. Okay. Yes. Okay. And um, how much of those are automated? And um, assume some part is manual, uh, or decision what story goes where is partly done manually. Yeah. So uh, as a general workflow uh, kind of principle, um, we will we, we want to allow manual override for everything, but uh, automate uh, the the actual placement of things. So if we say uh, just put the latest ones or the or, or uh, you know, the, the highest uh, ranked ones or the most popular ones, it'll automatically move them into place. Uh, but at any point, a user can come by uh, and, and shift that out and say, I, I want to give more uh, 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 precedence to, to, to a different story. Does that answer your question? Yes, and, and how much effort did you put into um, improving the user experience for users who do that by, uh, well, live preview or drag and drop or um, features like this? Uh, I mean, parallelization, so some people can work on uh, upper part of a channel page and some people on the lower part. Um, very rarely will you see that.